Hey everyone, and welcome to another week of the weekly scripture reading with My House Ministries. I'm Zach, and I'm excited for each and every one of you to join us on this journey as we continue reading through the Word of God. This episode is titled Life After Death and the Promise of Atonement, because week 29, Akari Mot, deals with after the death of Nadab and Abihu in the Day of Atonement, a prophetic and beautiful picture of of our Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua. Week 29 after the death is the Torah portion for Leviticus 16.1 through 18.30, the prophet section Isaiah 44.1 through 28, the writing section 1 Samuel 8 through 9.27, and the New Testament section is John 21 through 18 and Philippians 2.1 through 30. So life after death Ephesians 10 seems to really sum up what it means to have life after death. Because you were dead in your trespasses and your sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body in the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that one may, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, God, he prepared this all beforehand. His Torah, his instructions, so that we could perfectly walk in them. With Yeshua, Jesus Messiah, being our perfect example. Because as grace abounds grace, when we walk in his ways, there is more grace that empowers us to continue walking in that way. But this is such a beautiful passage because we were all dead. We were all Nadab and Abihu burned up on the altar for bringing this strange fire. We were all dead in our sin, dead in our trespasses. But we have this gift, this atonement that we're going to be discussing tonight. So after the death, what does after the death mean? This Torah portion titled Akare Mot, After the Death. Well, that's exactly how Leviticus 16 starts off. So Yahweh spoke to Moshe after the death of the two sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, as they drew near before Yahweh and died. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Speak to Aaron and your brother not to come in at all times in the set-apart place, inside the veil before the Lord of Atonement, which is on the ark, lest he die, because I appear in the cloud above the Lord of Atonement. So backtracking a few weeks, we talked about Leviticus 10, Nadab and Abihu, and what it meant to bring strange fire to the altar. And so we saw in Leviticus 10 that Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his fire holder and put fire in it, and put incense on it, and brought strange fire before Yahweh, which he had not commanded them to do. Fire came out from Yahweh and consumed them, and they died before Yahweh. Then Moshe said to Aaron, This is what Yahweh spoke, saying, by those who come near me, let me be set apart. And before all the people, let me be esteemed. And Aaron was silent. And Moses called Mishael and to El Tzaphan, the sons of Uzael, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near, take your brothers from before the set apart place out of the camp. So they came near and took them by their long shirts out of the camp, as Moses had said. So what's great 
about this that we see, what comes from this is a whole list of instructions for what it means to be set apart, what it means to separate the clean and the unclean. Because right after the death, it says, do not drink wine or strong drink, nor your sons with you. When you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die a law forever throughout your generations, so as to make a distinction between the set apart and the profane, between the unclean and the clean, and to teach the children of Israel all the laws which Yahweh has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. So we see the next six chapters that we read together are all stemming from this verse after the death, detailing to us what it means to make a distinction between clean and unclean and how important that was to know the difference between holy and the profane. So could the reference of after the death, could this be why the Day of Atonement is now detailed? After these, the death of Nadab and Abihu, who did not distinguish between the clean and the unclean, now that he has detailed for us the holy and the profane, what it means to make atonement for the people of Israel. So the Day of Atonement, what is it? A quick reminder is that this is one of the appointed times. Yom Kippur is the Hebrew word for Day of Atonements. And so in Genesis 1.14, we see that God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So if this is your first time hearing about appointed times, this is your first time hearing about God's holy days, that word for season in most of our translation is the Hebrew word moedim. And it's the same exact word we see in Leviticus 23.1, which is really the uh, starting point, the great summary, if you will, for all of God's set-apart holy days. And we see in Leviticus 23.1, it says, Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The appointed times of Yahweh, which you are to proclaim as set-apart gatherings, my appointed times are these. So that underlined my appointed times, that's the same word we see for seasons in Genesis 1.14. They are his, Moedim, his holy set-apart times. He put the sun, the moon, and the stars in the sky for us to know when these appointments will be. They are set times. They are fixed times. They are not going to change. He is not going to miss them. And he has called us and invited us to be there. So in Leviticus 23, we see a brief overview of this day of Yom Kippur, this day of atonements, and what it means uh, in a quick summary. Leviticus 23, 26 says, And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, On the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a set-apart gathering for you. You shall afflict your beings and shall bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh. And you do no work on that same day. For it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before Yahweh your Elohim. For any being who is not afflicted on that same day, he shall be cut off from his people. And any being who does any work on that same day, that being I shall destroy from the midst of his people. You do no work, a law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It is a Sabbath of rest to you, and you shall afflict your beings. On the ninth day of the month at evening, from evening to evening, you observe your Sabbath. So a couple of things really stick out. Um, the word afflict being used so many times should stand out. And we're going to see it again here in Leviticus 16. Um, but also a law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So there's going to be some instructions. There's going to be some commands that pertain just to the land. And it lets us know that. The Passover, for example, it says you cannot sacrifice the Passover in any of your dwellings, but only the place where I make my name dwell, says Yah of hosts. So where he makes his name dwell, that's the only place the sacrifice can be done. However, the Day of Atonement, keeping a Sabbath, doing no work, and afflicting your being, that's a law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. That's something that we can still be doing today. So it's going to be important to understand what it means to afflict ourselves and understand how the Day of Atonement applies to us as believers today. Afflict your being. So this is something that can 
kind of be twisted and kind of uh, be a little bit confusing. So let's take a work, look at that word afflict, and it's the Hebrew word ana. So we see it in Exodus 10, 3, and it says, Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus said Yahweh Elohim of the Hebrews, Till when shall you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go so that they may serve me. So this word ana in this sense is to humble yourself before God. So we are submitting, we are afflicting ourselves of our own personal desire and humbling ourselves before him. Isaiah 53, 7 is another uh, popular one with this word afflict. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, but he did not open his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent, but he did not open his mouth. So uh, a prophetic verse that's often used with our Messiah Yeshua and again, it was he was afflicted. How is that being used there um, in uh, an idea of being oppressed and being afflicted? Another passage that uses it is Isaiah 25, 5. You subdue the noise of foreigners as heat in a dry place, as heat in the shadow of a cloud. The singing of the ruthless is subdued. And again, Zechariah 10, 2. For the household idols spoke emptiness. The diviners saw falsehood. And relate dreams of deceit they comfort in vain therefore they have wandered about like sheep they are afflicted for there is no shepherd so again this word afflicted um, is really used in, in multiple ways um, but not necessarily always in a way that's commonly taught which is to uh, a day of fasting and to afflict your being in, in a way of fast now fasting is, is definitely a way that can be a way to afflict yourself, but is requiring people to fast on the Day of Atonement adding to the Word of God? Well, that leads us into our next topic, truth versus tradition. Because traditionally, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is associated with fasting as a form of affliction. So like I just said, it can certainly be a way to afflict yourself, but is it the only way? So before we get into this topic of truth versus tradition, let's start by saying we, we need to make sure we're not making the mistake of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Not all tradition is bad. When tradition is bad is when it is forced upon somebody as fact or as a commandment or an instruction or it is held above the word of God. For instance, the Torah portion is a tradition. There's no scripture that says you have to read the scripture on a certain day in a certain way in order to properly observe the commandments. However, it's beneficial when we break down the Torah in a systematic way and read it together because iron sharpens iron. We're all on the same page. We're all studying the same uh, text at the same time, and we can really grow as a body. There's a big benefit there, but forcing that upon someone is adding to the word of God. So as we talk about truth and tradition, let's keep that in mind over the next couple verses in the couple of topics that we discuss. Truth versus tradition. I want to ask a little question here because many of us have rejected the traditions of Christianity and the main holidays associated with it as we see the blatant error in serving the one true God in ways that other nations have served their gods and adopted these traditions as going against the scripture. However, when we leave one side of the narrow road, are we jumping into traditions on the other side that could also be rooted in something that's not scriptural, that's not biblical, whether it be symbols like the, the Star of Rafan that's shown here and the picture of the nine candle Hanukkah, which is somewhat of a, of a discrepancy against the seven candle menorah, which we talked about a few weeks back. Do we really question the traditions in Judaism when we leave Christianity? Or do we just jump right in with two feet? It's important that we make sure we're staying on the narrow road and that we are questioning these traditions and not just assuming they are good 
because it's important, again, to let Scripture interpret Scripture and really dive in. Because Scripture speaks strongly about adding to the Word of God and holding tradition over truth. Deuteronomy 4.2 says, You shall not add to the Word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. See, that sums up Christianity and Judaism in a nutshell. Judaism adds to the Word of God. They uphold the Talmud, they uphold the, the oral law in equal, if not greater value than the written Word of God handed down from the mouth of God to Moses. However, Christianity takes away from. They say that, uh, well, this isn't required anymore. We don't have to do this. We don't have to do that. Um, it's really just all about love. But how do you love? Well, God gives us instructions on how to do that. Deuteronomy 12, 32 tells us, Whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add nor take away from it. Revelation 22, 18 says, Testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. Strong words against adding to or taking away from the word of God. We have to be careful that we are being scriptural and not following traditions of man. Because even our Messiah Yeshua had strong words about following tradition above the words of God. Mark 7 says the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your taught ones not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And he answering said to them, Well did Yeshayahu Isaiah prophesy concerning you hypocrites, as it has been written. This people respect me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as teachings the commands of men. Forsaking the command of God, the command of Elohim, you hold fast the tradition of men. And he said to them, Well, do you set aside the command of God, Elohim, in order to guard your own tradition? Are we doing that today? Whether it's on the left side or the right side of the narrow road, are we guarding tradition, tradition that's been passed down to us by setting aside the commands of God? Again, not all tradition is bad if the tradition is helping us or reinforcing us to keep the word of God. But if we're holding fast to a tradition that is in error or that is in contradiction to the word of God or that is in rooted that is rooted in serving other gods or serving God in the way that nations serve other gods, then let's throw that out. Let's cast it all away and let's get back to the basics. Let's get back to doing things the way that our Messiah, Jesus Yeshua, did them so that we could follow completely in his footsteps. So let's talk a little bit about Jewish tradition for the Day of Atonement. So Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is considered the most important holiday in the Jewish faith, falling in the month of Tishri, uh, which is a tradition, traditional name in and of itself. It marks the culmination of the 10 days of awe, again a Jewish tradition, a period of introspection, repentance, that follows Rosh Hashanah, again the Jewish New Year. God's New Year is in the spring. According to tradition, it is on Yom Kippur that God decides each person's fate. So Jews are encouraged to make amends and ask forgiveness for sins committed during the past year. The holiday is observed with a 25-hour fast and a special religious service. Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah are known as Juda Judaism's High Holy Days. So a couple of traditions here that are not biblical. Uh, number one, like I mentioned, God's new year starts in the spring. Exodus 12 says uh, this will be the first of years for you. So Rosh Hashanah, the new year is actually in the spring. So the, the Jews have two new years, a, a religious new year and a secular, secular, secular new year. Um, according to tradition, again, Yom Kippur is a day that God decides each person's fate. Um, this is actually interesting because the, the Day of Atonement, we're going to talk about how Yeshua separates the sheep from the goats. So again, um, not all tradition is completely wrong. Uh, but the idea that you're encouraged to make amends and ask forgiveness for sins com committed during the past year, 
wh why wait? Why are we waiting till uh, one day to do it? We should constantly be living in a day of, of repentance. So some more Jewish tradition that is involved in this day uh, is fasting on Yom Kippur, which is mandated by the Torah in positive mitzvah 164. I've not been able to find anywhere where it's mandated in the Torah. We're commanded to afflict our beings. Again, this is from askmoses.com. It says the Torah commands us to afflict ourselves on the 10th of Tishri, so Yom Kippur. It says the Mosaic tradition teaches us that afflict means to de-emphasize the body's needs in the five areas of bathing, using creams, oils, perfumes, or other skin accessories, wearing leather shoes, sexual relations, eating and drinking. It even goes on to say, what's the big deal about eating and drinking? Actually, it's a very big deal. Yom Kippur is God's designated annual day of total spirituality. On Yom Kippur, we get into things that make us like angels the most and out of things that make us like animals the most. We spend the whole day in tefillah and put our bodily cravings on the back burner. Tefillah is what makes us most like the angels and eating and drinking is what makes us most like animals. On Yom Kippur, we try to soar as high as we can, not worrying about what's to eat helps keep that in focus. So striving to be like angels doesn't seem very biblical uh, and is uh, kind of an, an, a weird way of, of talking about fasting. Um, so again, to afflict oneself, does it really mean to fast? You know, afflicting can certainly be a fasting can certainly be a, a great way of afflicting. However, it might not be the best way for all people. How do we really afflict ourselves and humble ourselves and make sure that we are doing it the proper way? I think we just need to continue diving into the Word of God and, and really seek Him. Uh, 119 Ministries has a great video on the Day of Atonement. And what it means to afflict is it really a day of fasting so for more detail uh, please check out that video so atonement instructions and let's get into the meat of Leviticus 16 and some of the details here so if you remember uh, we started off this chapter with Yahweh spoke to Moshe after the death of the two sons and Yahweh said to Moses speak to Aaron your brother not to come in the set apart in at all times to the set apart place inside the veil before the lid of atonement, which is on the ark, lest he die, because I appear in the cloud above the lid of atonement. So we've spent the last 16 chapters talking about how Yeshua is our sacrifice. He is our atonement. How everything in the book of Leviticus is pointing to him. It's no different here with the day of atonement. See, God is so holy and he is so perfect as we've been talking about these last couple weeks. That when he appears above them in the lid of atonement, that if you're not right with God, if you're not at one mint with him, atonement, at one mint, that you will be consumed by that holy and perfect fire. Because he is, as we talked a few weeks back, an all-consuming fire. So I just have a picture here of the Holy of Holies and of the lid of atonement, also known as the mercy seat above the ark. And this is uh, what this chapter is starting to talk about. So it continues with this, Aaron with this should come into the set apart place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. He should put on the set apart linen long shirt with linen trousers on his flesh and gird himself with a linen girdle and be dressed with a linen turban. They are set apart garments. So I have a photo here of their normal priestly garments that we discussed in depth um, a few chapters back at the end of Levi uh, the end of Exodus before we started the book of Leviticus together and what the linen garments would have looked like. He shall bathe his body in water and shall put them on. So last week we talked about the mikvah, the baptism, and how this all ties back into the cleansing and being cleansed. Again, something we continue to see here. And from the congregation of the children of Israel, he shall take two male goats as a sin offering, one ram as a burnt offering. And Aaron shall bring the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. So it's easy when we read through Leviticus and we see all these offerings and all these sacrifices that they start to kind of mix and blend together. 
So if you go back to the beginning of when we started this Leviticus section together, we talked about some of these different offerings and what they meant. What the burnt offering was, what the sin offering was, what the trespass offering, the grain offerings, and how they were all different and what they required. We're seeing many of those offerings play out here as Aaron is making atonement for himself and making atonement for the set apart place. Again, he is cleansing it. It's a purification because we're going to see that the atonement, the day of atonement where the sins are ascribed actually aren't sacrificed at all. Interesting. Yes, we're going to see that here in just a minute. It says, he shall take the two goats and let them stand before Yahweh at the door at the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for Yahweh and the other lot for Azazel. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the lot fell for Yah and shall prepare it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot for Azazel fell is caused to stand alive before Yah to make atonement upon it and send it into the wilderness to Azazel. So the goat where the lot fell for Azazel stays alive, and that is what the atonement is made. More details for both who or what Azazel is coming up and what it means that the atonement sacrifice didn't die. So it continues with Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself. So the bull is for himself and for his house for the priests and shall slaughter the bull as a sin offering which is for himself he shall make the fire holder filled with burning coals of fire from the altar before yah with his hand filled with sweet incense beaten fine and he shall bring it inside the veil and he shall put the incense on the fire before yah with the cloud of incense shall cover the lid of atonement which is on the witness lest he die And he shall take some of the blood and of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the lid of atonement on the east side also in front of the lid of atonement he sprinkles some of the blood with his finger seven times he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering which is for the people and shall bring its blood inside the veil and shall do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the lid of atonement in front of the lid of atonement so remember the bull was for Uh, was a purification for him and for the priest, his house. And now he's making atonement for the set apart place with the goat for the people. So this is all cleansing the set apart place, not necessarily cleansing the people. It's preparing the set apart place, cleansing the set apart place for the presence of God because it says of the uncleanness of the children of Israel in 16 and because of their transgression and all their sins they were defiling the set apart place it says and so he does this for the tent of meeting which is dwelling with them in the midst of their uncleanness so he's setting apart this place not necessarily the people so again keep this in mind as we continue to read and no one should be in the tent of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the set apart place until he comes out he shall make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of israel again a purification for the set apart place he shall go out to the altar that is before yah and make atonement for it so now he's atoning for the altar and he shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around He shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it, set it apart from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Because of our sin, because of our uncleanness, everything becomes defiled. So he's setting apart this place for the presence of God to come into their midst. This is where things get interesting. It says, when he has finished atoning for the set apart place in the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and shall confess over it all the crookedness of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins and shall put on the head of the goat and then shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a fit man. So the sacrifice of the bull and the sacrifice of the goat where the lot was cast for Yah is atoning and setting apart, purifying the set apart place. All of the sins are confessed over this live goat. The goat shall bear it on himself, it says in 22, all their crookedness to a land that is cut off, that she shall send the goat away into the wilderness. 
So again, some really interesting pictures that are being painted in our head here. Um, as this, all of the sin is being put on this live goat, the scapegoat, this goat for Azazel, as we read earlier. So who or what is Azazel? So the Septuagint actually calls it the sent away uh, in, instead of the, the term Azazel. The King James translates it as scapegoat. So that's a pretty common word used here. Rabbis later on have suggested that this just means rugged of God, referring to the mountain the goat was cast down when he's sent out into the wilderness. They were worried, uh, tradition later became that they were worried that this goat would come back into the camp, so they actually threw it down a mountain um, and to ensure that it wouldn't come back. Again, that's nowhere in the text. It just says they were released into the wilderness. The Book of Enoch, which we talked about a few weeks back, uh, refers to a fallen angel. Uh, so if you go back to week 22 of the weekly scripture reading, we discuss this in much more depth. And there's actually a Dead Seas, a book of the Dead Sea Scrolls known as the Book of the Giants, which talks about uh, Azazel as well. So quickly, I wanted to talk about these two pictures that I found. The first one is from 1862, uh, a French painter, Louis Le Breton. And so interesting that this picture of Azazel, um, him with his goat, looks a lot like Satan, Hasatan, the devil, with his pitchfork and horns on his head. Interestingly enough, it almost looks like he has goat legs, uh, which kind of reminds me of uh, the god Pan, which we're going to talk here in, in just a moment. Um, the second one is, is very interesting that I found as well. It's a Persian artist from the 1800s, Abu Jafar. And it was depicted as when Adam was created, that the angels were uh, showing their obeisance by bowing before him, realizing that man was ab above the angels, except for Azazel, who would not bow uh, to Adam. So again, interesting that this Azazel character has been kind of known and, and found throughout history. Another interesting verse that we're going to read uh, in the next chapter in this same Torah portion is Leviticus 17.7. Again, this idea of goats being involved with the Day of sac uh, the day of Atonement. It says, So they shall no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons, after whom they whore. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout their generations. Goat demons to which they whore. Interesting, as Azazel is depicted as this goat-looking being, above and how the uh, pan the goat god and the connection we found to the grotto of pan again if you go back to week 22 we cover this in so much more depth um, but the grotto of pan the gates of hell is actually where we believe yeshua took his disciples um, right before the day of atonement and so it was located at the base of mount hermon where the watcher angels actually descend in the book of Enoch, Azazel being one of these leaders, uh, it was a cult center of fertility for the god Pan. It was an area where the tribe of Dan actually set up pagan temples as well. Uh, Josephus described it as a deep cavern filled with water, the bottom of which no one could ever reach. Ancients believed it was a gate to hell. Again, very interesting, which we're, what we're going to be talking about here in a minute. And it was a place of child sacrifice. Um, so... Enoch 10 tells us exactly who Azazel is, if you believe Enoch is or should be part of scripture, or at the very least is an extra biblical text which fills us in with more history. Many cast out the book of Enoch altogether. Um, I don't really know if that's wise. I, th I think there is a lot that can be found in the book of Enoch. Um, I would almost say that I believe that it was and should be a part of scripture. So Enoch 10 says this, Again, the Lord said to Raphael, bind Azazel hand and foot, because we see just a few verse, a few chapters before, Azazel taught many of the sins to men and women, and it says, cast him into darkness, and opening the desert, which is in Dudael, cast him in there, throw upon him hurled and pointed stones, covering him with darkness, there, there shall he remain forever cover his face that he may not see the light 
and in the great day of judgment, let him be cast into the fire. Restore the earth which the angels have corrupted and announce life to it that I may revive it. So a lot of the punishment was put on Azazel for what he did to and what he taught to the people. It sounds a lot like the lake of fire, which we connected to the wilderness just a few weeks ago. And in Revelation 20, where it says the devil who had been who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire similar to this language of Enoch, into which the beast and false prophet had already been thrown. There they will be tormented day and night forever. Very interesting when you think about our Messiah, Jesus Yeshua, returning as our high priest, as our king, casting out Hasatan. Could he be ascribing the sin of all mankind to Hasatan, just like the scapegoat? And Hasatan being thrown out into the wilderness, the lake of fire, cut off forever and ever. Very interesting indeed. So Yeshua, our high priest, because it all points to him. It all points to Jesus, Yeshua. He is on every single page, in every single word. He is the word made flesh. So we're talking about these two goats. And again, we just made the connection to uh, the, the goat that was sacrificed and the goat that was ascribed all sin. Could that be Hasatan? Uh, a lot of people connect the Day of Atonement to when he is locked up. And he, when Yeshua first returns, it says that he is locked up for a thousand years. And also, again, I believe the Day of Atonement is connected to uh, after that a thousand years, when sin is erased and sin is no more. So let's talk a little bit about Matthew 5 because we see an interesting picture and again pointing to this idea of the sheep and the goats. It says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for Hasatan, the devil, and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And again, we see in the book of Hebrews how everything in Leviticus points to our Messiah. And so for a, a more in-depth study on Hebrews 9 and 10, uh, go back to the beginning of the Leviticus section of the weekly scripture reading. Uh, but for this week, we want to make this connection just in Hebrews 9 here to Yeshua, our high priest on the Day of Atonement. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly thing to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence that ties so much into this week's portion about uh, having sacrifices made to purify the sins of the people we talked about how those sacrifices were purifying the set apart place for the presence of god he is appearing 
on our behalf in the presence of God. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters into the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own, talking about the day of atonement. Otherwise, Christ would have to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. That's a very interesting verse in verse 28. He's not bearing sin the second time. Just as the goat isn't sacrificed, the scapegoat, the goat for Azazel, is the one who bears the sin. When Yeshua returns, he's not bearing the sin. But could he be the high priest that is ascribing the sin, that is confessing the sin, over the goat Hasatan, who is being thrown out into the wilderness an interesting thought an interesting connection that could be made could that be why we see what we see on the day of atonement which brings us into this idea of the book of life because that's what this is all about we want to be written in the lamb's book of life we want to make sure that the day of atonement is atoning for our sins, that we are being separated as the sheep on the right and not the goats on the left, that we are doing to the least and not just doing well before others and, and, and boasting in our works or boasting in, in anything that is less than who he is as our Savior and as our God. It says, the next day Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin, and I now will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for you. Again, the Exodus 32 portion, we talked all about this in the day of atonement. So go back to, to week 22 if you want a, a more in-depth study about this as well. It says, so Moses returned to the Lord and said, alas, the people have sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. So this book, the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, is something that's discussed again and again throughout scripture, which ties into this day of atonement. We see the same thing in Daniel 7. It says, As they kept watching, thrones were set in high place. The Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white like snow, and the hair of his head like whitest wool. His throne was flaming fire. Its wheels were blazing fire. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from his presence. Thousands upon thousands served him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was convened, and the books were opened. We see almost word for word this imagery in Revelation 20. It says, Then I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. I also saw the dead and the great and small standing before the throne and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. And Revelation 21. I did not see a sanctuary in it because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its sanctuary. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because God's glory illuminates it and its lamp is the Lamb, the Almighty Lamb of God. The nations will walk in its light, hallelujah, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Each day its gates will never close because it will never be night there. They will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Nothing profane will ever enter it, and no one who does what is vile or false, but only those written in the Lamb's book of life. So hallelujah, praise God for the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain from the foundations of the earth, 
the lamb that is returning as our perfect judge, our king, our high priest who will separate the sheep from the goats. May it be our goal and our desire to follow him with all of our heart so we can be written in that book of life on the day of atonement that he would atone for all of our sins and that we would desire and wish to sin no more. So as we continue the rest of the portion for this week, the big chunk of it being Leviticus 16 and the Day of Atonement, uh, let's dive into the next two chapters just a little bit as well. Leviticus 17 is pretty interesting, talking about uh, food, uh, the meat consumed, and this idea of, of how it should be done. And is this just for sacrifices and offerings? Let's take a look. Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, Speak to Aaron to his sons and to all the children of Israel and say to them, this is the word which Yahweh has commanded saying, any man from the house of Israel who slaughters a bull or a lamb or a goat in the camp or who slaughters it outside the camp and does not bring it to the door of the tent of meeting to bring an offering to Yahweh before the dwelling place of Yahweh, blood guilt is reckoned to that man. He has shed blood and that man shall be cut off from among his people in order that the children of Israel bring their slaughterings which they slaughter in the open field and they shall bring them to Yahweh at the door of the tent of meeting to the priests and slaughter them as peace offerings to Yah most high interesting I've read this portion six or seven times before and it has hit me so different this time Uh, it's a very interesting verse it says any man who slaughters a bull lamb or goat that word for slaughter actually means just to kill. It's not really talking about just a sacrifice. And that's the way I've kind of seen it in the past is if you're making a sacrifice, you have to be doing it in the right way at the door of the tent of meeting. I believe now that this is talking about at the time that this was being written, they were all living in the presence of God, that his presence was there, that everything that they killed had to be brought to him as an offering. And we see this because it says anything that they slaughter, whether in the camp or outside of the camp, and they do not bring it to the door as an offering, then blood guilt is reckoned upon that man. So that's very interesting. And again, I believe because they are living with him, his presence in the set apart place in such close proximity. Because we see this differ in Deuteronomy. And it says, guard yourself that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see, except in the place which Yahweh chooses in one of your tribes. There you are to offer your burnt offerings. And there you are to do all that I command you. So when they enter the land in a territory for one of the 12 tribes in each territory, they're going to have a place where they can where Yahweh will choose for his name to dwell and they could do these offerings. However, it says when Yahweh your Elohim enlarges your border as he promised you and you say, let me eat meat because you long to eat meat. You eat as much meat as your being desires. When the place where Yahweh your Elohim chooses to put his name is too far from you, then you shall slaughter from your herd and from your flock, which Yahweh has given you as I commanded you. And you shall eat within your gauge as much as your being desires, only as the gazelle and the deer are eaten. So you are to eat of it. The unclean and the clean alike eat of it. Only the set-apart gifts which you have and your vowed offerings you are to take to the to go to the place where Yahweh chooses. So when his when he's enlarging the border, they're now allowed to eat eat of the herd and of the flock so when they're living in close proximity with him everything that they kill the lamb the ox the goat which are all part of the flock and the herd has to be brought to the tent of meeting however when they are no longer living in his presence and he's enlarged their border and it's too far for them to do so he's saying you can do this but you must do it only as the deer and as the gazelle are eaten So how are the deer and the gazelle eaten is something that we need to study out uh, over the next couple weeks 
maybe once we get to the Deuteronomy portion. I just wanted to throw that out there this week because I thought that was really fascinating in Leviticus 17 and how that was worded. So Leviticus 17 continues talking about some of this uh, idea of, of eating and how to eat food and how to eat the, the meat that he has given us. It says, In any man of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among you who eats any blood, I shall, I shall set my face against that being who eats blood, and he shall be cut off from among his people for the life of the flesh is in the blood and i have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your lives for it is the blood that makes atonement for the life there's another beautiful picture of the blood of the lamb atoning for our lives therefore i said to the children of israel no being among you eats blood nor does any stranger who sojourns among you eat blood Leviticus 18 gets a little bit PG-13 because we're talking about laws for relations and, and sexual relations uh, between people. So starts off by saying, Yah spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am Yah, your Elohim. Do not do as they do in the land of Egypt, the land of Mitzrayim, where you dwelt. And do not do as they do in the land of Canaan. Where I am bringing you, do not walk in their laws. Do my right rulings. Guard my laws to walk in them. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. So what were the ways of the Egyptians? Just doing a Google search online, if you take a look at sexual practices of the Egyptians, you will find in multiple sources that incest, especially and not just in marriage, but premarital sex as well, was very well practiced. Homosexuality and gender flu fluidity was very common as well. Another crazy part was bestiality, necrophilia, and sacred prostitution. Keep all that in mind as we read through the Leviticus 18 portion. Another interesting thing is that he says don't not only to do as the Egyptians did, but do not do as Canaan does in the land where I am bringing you. Why is the land called Canaan? And why were they practicing these evil practices? Remember, Canaan was the offspring of Ham who had some kind of crazy act done with Noah, but Canaan was the one who was cursed. Why was Canaan cursed? We'll take a look about that in just a minute. It says, no one, is a, no one is to approach anyone of his own flesh to uncover his nakedness. I am Yahweh. The nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother you do not uncover. She is your mother. You do not uncover your nakedness. The nakedness of your father's wife you do not uncover. It is your father's nakedness. So the phrase in the saying, your father's nakedness, is also a way to say sleeping with your father's wife. So as we look in to Genesis 9 and the account of Noah again, it says, Noah, a man of the soil, began to plant a vineyard. <clears throat> and he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. Remember the phrase, father's nakedness, means to sleep with his father's wife and told his two brothers outside. So Sham and Japheth took a garment, laid it, up, laid it on both their shoulders, and went in backward and covered the nakedness of their father. But their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and he knew what his younger son had done to him. And he said, Cursed is Canaan. Let him become a servant of servants to his brothers. Why is Canaan cursed for Ham's sin? Well, if we take the phrase father's nakedness as sleeping with your father's wife, in this case, probably the mother of Ham, the offspring would be cursed. Could Canaan be the cursed offspring of this horrible sexual act between Ham and his father's nakedness, his father's wife? There are many different in-depth studies out there on this topic. I will link them here to this video. 
So Leviticus 18 continues with what to not uncover the nakedness of or have relations with a man and his sister, a man and his son's daughter, a father slash mother's sister, the father's brother's wife. Do not have relations with your daughter-in-law or your brother's wife. Do not have relations with a woman and her offspring, a woman and her sister, a woman during her monthly separation, the wife of a neighbor. Do not have homosexual homosexual relations. And it seems obvious, but do not partake in bestiality, having relations with animals. So in the midst of all this, it gives us a very interesting passage. It says, and do not give any of your offspring to pass through to Molech. And do not profane the name of your Elohim. I am Yah. So in a passage all about sexual relations, why is it talked about passing your offspring through Molech? And this picture that I saw circulate online came to mind. Uh, it's the statue of Molech and a woman holding up her baby with the words Planned Parenthood on it. And so yes, abortion is much like and, and much linked to this idea of, of sacrificing children to God. So could it be that it's put here in this passage with the idea of talking about sexual relations that you better not be having any type of relations with the intent of that offspring being sacrificed in the fires to Molech, to false gods, to pagan gods. There are consequences to our actions. Let us always remember that. Because he ends Leviticus 18 with, Do not defile yourselves with all these, for by all these the nations are defiled, which I am driving out before you. Thus the land became defiled. Therefore I punished it for its crookedness, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you, you shall guard my laws and my right rulings, and do not do any of these abominations, the native nor the stranger who sojourns among you, because the men of the land who were before you have done all these abominations, and thus the land became defiled. So let not the land vomit you out for defiling it, as it vomited out the nations that were before you. For whoever does any of these abominations, those being who do them, shall be cut off from among their people. And you shall guard my charge, so as not to do any of these abominable practices, which were done before you, so as not to defile yourselves by them. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. It's beautiful how he gives us this picture of atonement, this prophetic image of Messiah and the cleansing that will come through him. But he reminds us, even though I am atoning for your sin, even though I will make atonement for you, do not defile yourself. Because that's the promise that we still have today. Even though the blood of Yeshua is our salvation, the blood of Yeshua is the only thing that can separate us from the world and separate us from the sins of the world. Once we have that salvation, once we have realized who he is as our Messiah, are we just going to walk back in the ways of the world? Are we going to continue in our sin and continue defiling ourselves? We better not. And this portion really hits that home and shows us that we are not to defile ourselves with the ways of the nations. Some are going to be blatantly obvious. Don't have sexual relations with animals. Some aren't going to be as obvious, such as observing holidays and days that might look great and on the surface might seem great and on the surface might feel good to our flesh. But that's not the way God wants us to serve him. That's not the way God wants to be loved. So that's going to wrap up this week, week 29, Akare Motes of the weekly scripture reading. I'm going to end in a word of prayer. And again, I just want to thank all of you for diving into the word of God with us. Father, we just praise you and thank you 
for the blood of the lamb that is our atonement sacrifice and that makes atonement for all of us that just as the book of hebrews says that he alone is the one who separates us from our sin father we thank you that we although we were dead in our trespasses by your mercy and your grace we have been given life that we have life after death we thank you for the prophetic promise and the image that we see in your word of your lamb we just praise you and thank you for your sabbath a day that is set apart and holy that we get to come together each week and study your word and grow closer in our relationship with you i pray for this fellowship and for this group of people who are coming after you with all of their heart and trying to best serve you in all of their ways. And we thank you for the blood of the land that picks us up when we fall and allows us to enter back into covenant with you. We praise you and we thank you in the name of Yeshua and we say amen. Again, this has been week 29 of the weekly scripture reading with My House Ministries. As for me and my house, We will serve the Lord. Stay blessed. Mm